Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's At Home Tech Focus. You know, we're focusing on this episode on live events, and we have uh, four great experts from four great companies to kind of discuss what's going on. Uh, obviously, the last eight weeks to 10 weeks have seen a massive change in the definition of what exactly is at home, because literally everybody is at home. Um, so I wanted to kind of introduce our panelists real quickly. We have Matthew Goldman from MediaKind, Jim Jaquetta from Vidovation, Josh Lemer from Vista Worldlink, and Dan Maloney from Matrox Video. Uh, Josh, you are in the production spotlight uh, with your facilities down in, in Miami. Um, so I want to have you kind of kick things off with a quick little video overview of some of the projects you've been working on. So why don't you get us started with your, your quick little sizzle wheel. When she comes at me, I'm like, what the hell? What kind of pushes is that? Then she caught me. That's a huge overhand And then, right. dirty move. Look at that, that's a DQ. Welcome everybody to USL League Cup Rocket League Edition. Teams from the USL Championship and USL League One keeping us company all month long in the inaugural edition of this competition. Ketterer with time running out. Scores! Oh! El Paso wins game two in incredible fashion. I don't know how often you, you rewatched any of this or not, but I've been saying, Brittany, that like being able to rewatch it from this perspective, you forget about 90% of what happened beyond just the big oh, moments. Yeah. I don't know if that's the same for you or not. For sure. I think for me personally, you know, now I'm, I'm rewatching them all kind of through a different lens now that I've spent um, almost a whole season on the coaching staff. So, so that video just highlights some um, some of the events that we've been doing at Vista World Link that, you know, over the past five years transitioned from stereotypically a transmission company into a Remy centralized broadcast facility, bringing in content via a variety of different transmission methods uh, to produce it in the, in the Remy or at home workflow. And, you know, in today's world over the past nine, 10 weeks, everyone being at home, we've had to figure out creative ways to, you know, keep the narrative of our customers, you know, out there for, for their fans and, and consumers. So, um, you know, the first clip of uh, the bare knuckle fighting championship, that customer of ours was getting so much momentum with their live events that the, this pandemic really pulled the emergency break on some of that momentum. And they wanted to provide something that was unique and creative. So we put together a virtual hangout. As you can see, they had all of these um, fighters um, around, around the country and we brought them in utilizing different technology um, and uh, allowed them to explain the experience of them being in the, in the ring um, and, and having that experience and putting that out there for um, fans. So, you know, our, our executive producer was working from his home in Parkland, Florida, we had a uh, coordinating producer working from her home in Orlando, and we had the the content um, was you know was being played in in, a, in you know, live from the the archive from Vista's facility in Fort Lauderdale, and we had um, the fighters around the country coming in um, and creating that experience. So utilizing you know I, I always would say you know Vista could do it via satellite, fiber, IP. Then you would say, okay, we could also do bonded cellular, no problem. And now we're like, we could do it via Zoom, we could do it via Skype, you know, Google Hangout, pretty much any way we can, you know, get the content. Because I guess right now, as we're all experiencing, having content is better than having no content, even if the quality may not be at a level that we're, we're we we typically um, pride ourselves in in this industry. So um, that was really, you know, unique, and you know, um, it's it's you know, there's been a lot of viewership for that. Um, and then we, you know, one of our customers is the United Soccer League that we do so much volume on a normal, uh, you know, time and using the word normal is kind of a strange way of, you know, talking these days. But, you know, in, you know, just in last year alone, we produced, you know, hundreds and hundreds of events for the United Soccer League on both levels of the championship and, and League One. Um, and most of them featured on ESPN Plus and, and, and various linear ESPN channels. 
Um, and when this happened, again, they're like, how do we keep our fans and our supporters engaged? What are people doing while they're at home? They're playing video games. Can we create some sort of hybrid, organic, you know, way of, you know, um, you know entertaining our, our fans while we're all dealing with this? So um, they created this Rocket League championship, this E-Cup. And again, we had um, representatives playing the game all over North America. And we had um, our announcers, the, the voice of USL, Mike Watts and Devin Kerr, Mike being in New York and Devin being in, in, in Boca Raton, Florida. And they were called 64 matches over, you know, a, a 25, 30 day period from, and usually you would say from the luxury of their home. And now you say from the safety of their home, right? right, right. Um, <laughs> and, and that was really early on. You know, we, we literally were talking to the league, you know, the early days of, of this, of this craziness. And we, you know, I think we were talking about it on a, on a Friday and, and Wednesday we were live on ESPN plus with this. So, or, you right. know, so that was pretty exciting. Um, and then the, uh, the, the last clip of, of, of the video was, um, is, is content we've been doing with Sportsnet um, Rogers out of out of Montreal, and um, they've been using you know repurposing their historical content of of you know obviously that was um, an NBA you know that was NBA Finals match but it's been um, variety of different content hockey baseball um, you know, I think a, a lot of people at Vista were excited about the 2000 NBA um, uh, dunk contest where um, Vince Carter took took that prize. At, as a, as a Toronto Raptor and they've had their on-air personalities, you know, interacting and repurposing historical content. So um, one of our, you know, ideas at Vista was always, you know, kind of a one-stop shop aspect of at-home production where we're doing the production, but we're also archiving content in real time and creating this repository of, of assets. And there's never been more of a time where, you know, having those, uh, those assets has been, you know, so important and being able to repurpose them and creating interesting ways of having talent interact with that historical content has been so, so unique, especially with everyone um, needing, you know, some sort of entertainment and some sort of release from, from this pandemic. So, um, so it's yeah. been uh, interesting and creative of how to create new editorial. So, so were there new tools that you had to kind of bring in in-house? I mean, do you kiss we or, or yeah, or so, um, you know, we, we, before we started this, we were talking about Sportel and, you know, uh, in Miami and working with, you know, meeting Kiswe, I think, at IBC in 2019 and and then um, having discussions with them. We, we have used them and um, in a variety of ways. Uh, uh, the whole Sportsnet um, project has um, used our Cloudcast platform in, in, a, in, a, in a lot of different ways, has been great because there's been... Um, the ability of our producers being able to interact with the talent in a, in a remote situation, again, from the safety of their homes and not having to always come into the Vista facility to manage that has been key. Um, we, we've had like our MCR and our, our, you know, our, our NOC at Vista has been operational through this. So um, being able to play out content and, and code content and distribute it has been, um, been, been going on. But our um, creative producers and the editorial team have been able to do all this from home and tools like kiss we has been fantastic but you know there's times where we've had you know um, we've done things with um, you know uh, some of our corporate customers like pharmaceutical companies you know they still have you know conferences that um, doctors around the world need to explain different medication or different breakthroughs and whatnot and uh, we just had a, an event with a doctor out of Belgium last week, and the um, some platforms were a little too sophisticated. But they're like, but we know how to use Zoom because we talk with our grandchildren with right, Zoom. Right. So we use Zoom, <laughs> and you know, it, it's not the most you know being you know someone who uh, has grown up in the transmission world and and obviously in the production industry, you know, you get a little bit hesitant with prosumer gear, right? And you're nervous about it, but. Um, what's the, what's again, the codec? What codec are they using? Is it right. Simpty, you know? A hundred percent. And I think, I think we've always been a little bit hesitant with that type of gear coming into our world. And I, and, and I think this new world that we're all navigating is allowing um, 
some some acceptance of quality versus just having the content right if you have the content so um so i take my hat off to my team that you know they've been so ready for any time you know i'm asking a producer who's like last year produced over a thousand you know soccer matches can you now do a um, pharmaceutical event (laughs) with a doctor out of belgium but you know the attitude is whatever it takes. Let's let's get back to work. We want to be creative. We want to use the various tools that we've created to tell stories. And if the story right now is you know there's a doctor in Belgium that may have an idea about this vaccine, that 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 would be great, right? Um, right. Versus um, you know producing a um, a virtual watch party for combat sports. You know right now we're 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 excited about all the various opportunities that we have to. To, to, to work and, and use our craft. Right, excellent, great. Well, Jim, I'm gonna tee you up because obviously, uh, literally, um, earlier in the show, Dave Dukes and, uh, and, and uh, Greg from uh, PGA Tour Entertainment discussed the Charity Skins tournament a couple weeks back and you guys were involved with that. Um, as yes. far as the bonded cellular, that was a unique golf show yes. with six cameras. Can, so you have a couple slides too. So why don't you work through I do, I do. Um, while, while I bring up the slides, uh, to, to Joshua's point, um, we've done a, um, a few rentals, uh, uh, actually quite a few rentals to local production companies lately, uh, where they'll take our bonded, uh, video transmission unit. Uh, it also has a bonded internet capability. And, um, I got to go to Jerry O'Connell's house. Um, he, he was one, he was one, he's, he's best known for one of the, the little kids in the movie stand by me. Yes. Um, <laughs> Uh, he's been on the show billions lately, and his wife is the original blue X woman uh, on on the X Men. <laughs> so I got to go to their house, and they were so nice. Uh, they offered me food. They 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 were so gracious. But the the whole premise of the production was to take uh, three cell phones with Zoom, uh, a Mac computer with Zoom, using the cameras in the cell phones, using the cameras in the notebook computers. And believe it or not, multimillionaires don't necessarily have good internet access. So they live somewhere in the hills of Calabasas, and uh, they use one of our Avi West uh, uh, field encoders just to do a bonded internet connection, and it works really well. So they could have uh, three group sessions going on on three phone on two phones and a notebook. So um, we're we're doing Zoom, like you said, Josh, for school for work. Now we're going to watch TV shows with Zoom in it as well. That's that's the that's the new, the the new normal. So uh, as we had said earlier, um, um, we were talking before the call uh, about this um, PGA events. Uh, this past uh, Sunday, we had uh, um, Tiger Woods, uh, Phil Mickelson, uh, Tom Brady. Peyton Manning uh, playing a little golf. Uh, I believe that production was done in a more traditional manner. I believe NEP did the event on Sunday, uh, just a smaller crew. They actually used a bigger truck uh, so the operators could be spread out. Uh, What we did two Sundays ago was the uh, uh, tailor-made charity event. And um, uh, they wanted to minimize the footprint on site for that event uh, to less than 50 people. Um, they wanted to make sure uh, that, um, you know, they were complying to COVID uh, safety, six six feet apart. Um, a lot of these golfers, they're like, hey, I haven't caddied, my, I haven't been my own caddy since, uh, since uh, junior high school. Um, uh, I, haven't, I haven't caddied since I was a kid, so they had to carry their own bags. They had no, no <laughs> caddy with them. Um, but it, it um, uh, Vidovation and, and with some of our partners like Avi West, uh, we've been doing at-home productions uh, very successfully for more than four years now. Um, we've done shows like the uh, Live PD show. That's a multi-camera show. Uh, we're able to do bonded cellular in police cars going 120 miles an hour. This technology was meant for a reporter doing an interview on the courthouse steps, camera on a tripod in a fixed location, 
so now the technology is branching out, you know, doing reality TV, helping with Zoom uh, uh, production, similar to what Joshua is doing. And now uh, uh, we did the Ryder Cup uh, 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 recently with uh, Turner Sports. Uh, and now we're, we're doing a, uh, a PGA main events. So I don't know if you guys saw it. It was, it was a great event. I mean, it, it was great because the, the players were miked. Um, There's a bunch of parabolic microphones. So they were catching a lot of the audio and, you know, they're trying to do their golf etiquette while, while, while quietly trash talking each other. It was great. Um, and, and I, as you mentioned, Josh, that, that, you know, your analysts, your commentators, uh, some are, are local at, at the event. Some, some are in the compound at Seminole Golf Club. Uh, some of them were nearby. Some of them were working at home. Uh, so latency and, and uh, um, the production uh, workflow has to – bonded cellular, uh, doing at-home production with bonded cellular, we can get the latencies as low as half a second. Uh, but for this production, we did it at 1.4 seconds, just in case there are any bumps in the connection uh, to make sure we didn't have any dropouts. But I won't read the slide to you guys, but you can see here four golfers, uh, 28 television crew, 18 officials. The, the goal was to have uh, no more than 50 people uh, on site doing the event. Uh, they had... Uh, two bonded cellular uh, cameras uh, in the tee box. And some of these cameras rotated, like they, 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 they tee off, the cameras would follow, the fairway guys would loop back around. Uh, but, you know, th th this, this was a little fluid, but this was the, the basic plan. Uh, then two cameras uh, with the bonded cellular uh, units uh, on the fairway, and then uh, two cameras on the green. And... Uh, uh, the top tracer, that's the, um, you know, the red line that, that catches the ball. Um, one of the, one of the uh, uh, dif differentiating features of the Avi West technology is they have analog audio inputs on their bonded cellular units. Usually you can only bring audio in through the camera or through the embedded in the SDI. So they're actually able to bring in external audio and, and I'm not an expert at this, but the, the top tracer actually uh, sends its telemetry through an audio channel. So that worked out really nicely. So they had a, a top tracer rig in the tee box on the fairway to track uh, each of the player's shots. Uh, then they had a plane overhead. They used a traditional microwave link from the plane to the ground, but then from the, uh, um, from the ground, they backhauled that to master control uh, using bonded cellular. Uh, they had two, be uh, two beauty shots. Uh, they used the smaller Avi West unit. The, the Pro 380 has uh, eight cellular modems, gives you more diversity, uh, better reliability if you're in a congested area. Um, uh, they were able to do the beauty shots with two cellular modems using the, the Air 320. And this is all HEVC. I don't know. Did you see it, Ken? Uh, the, the picture. I, yeah, I might great. be. I might be biased. I might be great. biased, but uh, the pictures looked amazing. Had a beautiful day. The weather Sunday for for Tiger and 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 Phil's game wasn't so great. Um, then um, I mentioned Avi West having the analog audio input, so they had uh, commentators uh, on the on the course with them with microphones, and they they would interview the the players while they were walking the course. Um, you could see in some of the shots, uh, uh, one of the commentators had the Avi West backpack uh, on him. Uh, that was feeding his audio uh, back to master control. And then the players themselves uh, had wireless mics and then uh, there must have been technicians nearby wearing the, the Avi West uh, transmitter to get that back to master control. So you can see here, uh, oh, then there was the parabolic mic. So all these microphones on the course, there, there's crosstalk between the players' mics, between the parabolic mics, uh, the microphones in the camera. If there was the, the slightest bit of lip sync issue, uh, a video out of, out of Genlock, uh, this wouldn't have been possible. You know, with a live program, we all know you can't fix things in post. Uh, so how does Avi West do this? Um, 
you know, similar to, you know, other industry standards. Um, uh, this hasn't been standardized yet, but Avi West uses a, a protocol they call Safe Streams Transport or SST. And that's the special sauce that they do a form of precision timing protocol to keep everything in sync. It helps that the cellular units are locked to a, a GPS clock reference. So all of them are, are synchronized with GPS. So that's a start, but then sending timing information using, it's not quite PTP, but it's a similar, similar technique to keep everything uh, frame accurate, lip synced, uh, and in perfect gen lock. Perfect. Thank you. Well, like you know, Jim, that's great. Um, now I want to bring in Matthew because obviously Matthew, I think Jim hit on a couple points that you want to discuss um, from your perspective. So you want to start with a couple slides as well, and then uh, we'll get into the conversation. Right. So um, as we as as all of us have discussed before, I mean there are three three main challenges to doing an at home production on uh, this. We have to keep in mind, and those are all touched upon uh, as before. We have to make sure that we maintain the synchronization between audio to video and in, in the various types of uh, data and metadata that we're sending around. Because as was just mentioned, there's crosstalk between different things. You could have multiple cameras at uh, different locations around the venue. And obviously if you're switching the camera view, you don't want to have one that's out of the other. Or you don't have want to have the audio get out of sync on that. And when we're talking about uh, the at-home production, of course, uh, this is a nice diagram here. This is uh, sort of a generic diagram that shows the fact that you have the venue with the live feeds and you send them back to studio control, but you also get the comms back from the studio and you have to maintain this. So you really need to keep it under say a hundred milliseconds or so. Otherwise the, um, the local talent won't be able to, uh, well, they'll be able to do it because they're professionals, but it's difficult to stay in sync when you're, when you're, when um, the audio or the video was lagging back on the production that you're doing at the, um, at the at-home facility remote from the venue versus what you have locally. And then of course, um, you would, uh, depending on the particular situation, either be IP encapsulated video over the fixed lines, it could be over uh, the internet as we discussed, or wireless connections, and it could be over, of course, um, satellite uh, satellite links as well. And then once you get to the uh, to production facility, then you can send on finished production and send it back to remote on that. So um, obviously through this, then you have to minimize the end-to-end uh, -end latency for doing this. And the last thing, of course, is you need to have the bandwidth. If it's a primary facility and you have a lot of bandwidth, then you're able to uh, do things uncompressed or perhaps using light compression, such as uh, JPEG 2000 or, or J the new uh, JPEG XS that's uh, becoming more and more popular. But if you don't have a lot of bandwidth, you really got to crunch it down and still keep latency low, then you really need to use the best and latest grade uh, of the uh, 100 to 1 type of compressions or 151 types, such as high efficiency video coding uh, that was also mentioned before. And in the case of what we've been doing with uh, MediaKind, obviously things have changed, but had the Olympics been held, we actually uh, were providing for the OBS, the Olympic uh, Broadcasting uh, uh, Services there. The, uh, we had uh, 48 4K uh, uh, live uh, uh, four, uh, UHD uh, contribution feeds using our AVP 2000, uh, it, was, it was HEVC. It's a very, um, it's, it's, it's a small, it's a small device. It uh, can do um, four, 4K feeds in a single uh, single uh, rack unit unit, and then also of course receiving end you need to have a, a, a decoding device in that which we have as the RX1, and um, as sort of related to this, for instance, Discovery uh, was using 40 of these RX1s to do various levels of um, 4K Ultra HD T code uh, decoding around it, and and you, again you could use traditional interfaces such as SDI, but I want to point out that in areas of the production that could do it. They were using the newer SMPTE uh, ST2110 uh, professional media over real-time um, uh, IP transport for doing that. And uh, as is shown in the diagram here, you can have, it doesn't matter which one is primary and backup, it depends on the system, but you can have a, um, uh, you know, a fiber link uh, back up the satellite or the satellite link back up the fiber. Because as you know, these, as we talk all the time amongst us here, um, this is a live event, 24 by 7 by 365. There can be no downtime. You have to make sure you have this. And so you look at these combination of things you have. 
24 by 7 by 365, high availability, reliability, low latency, best picture quality and audio quality possible. It, as you can tell, we uh, have a lot of demands on what we have to do. And uh, to feed all this, had we had NAB, we had many of these demos that we were going to have at, at NAB, where we actually had a, um, a mock-up racetrack. Uh, you can come in and play with the cars. They were, uh, you know, radio, uh, radio-controlled cars that we had on the track uh, in the booth. And we, in there, we had all sorts of cameras mounted around it with live feeds. We also had 360-degree cameras on there. And you could basically feed those back into the production right on site. And we uh, were able to do this and do uh, on-site encoding um, as well as decoding in real time in front. Two various things, we had the video monitors for doing that. We also, at the same time, were doing a live in the cloud production of 360 degrees to show people how you can do that. Uh, and we had tablets doing ultra HD as well as the monitors themselves. So it's a pretty comprehensive solution and to end the show how you really can do uh, high quality uh, at home production today and also um, uh, to move beyond, you know, at home production, the ultimate at home production, as uh, most of our equipment now has moved from, uh, you know, physical purpose built hardware to really uh, more cloud cloud native production. So it's software defined media production and it's sitting in the cloud. And if you really take the at home concept to the extreme, it's distributed cloud computing or where's at home? At home could be, particularly in the times of COVID-19, right? At home could be people wearing their bathrobes and slippers. I, I, I don't want to have that vision of Ken doing that, but uh, <laughs> uh, but you, you all can share the same uh, cloud feeds for doing this and really do a high quality production for doing that and, and can prove it either as a service or, um, and again, your own private cloud or whatever for doing that. Thank you, Matthew. I, I have very nice bunny slippers, by the way. I just want to let you know. <laughs> sure that. So, but the, the fun, only the finest. So, so I want to bring Dan in also for part of this conversation. But Matthew, back to um, your three points. So this is for all of you. And Dan, you'll be second to, to chime in on this. But can you talk about the whole, uh, let's talk about the bandwidth. Let's, let's start with that. Because obviously right now what's going on is people are, their talents at their home. They don't have the same amount of bandwidth. So for, for all of you, what do you see as the challenge right now as far as just the scale of of pushing the envelope, if you will, of, of bandwidth and really kind of wringing the most out of, out of really kind of, I mean, networks where there's just not a lot of consistency and a lot of um, you know, reliability, you know, pure reliability. I mean, what's your, what's your sense, Matthew, as far as what the last eight weeks have meant for just kind of changing some of the conversations around what is acceptable amount of bandwidth? Um, are we, are we right. part of the bleeding edge? Right. So we were talking about before, we always are, we always are grasping with these issues. And so do you pull on one and something else gets moved along in there, but you want to have the highest possible bandwidth again at low latency. Yes. And if you don't, and if you don't have those combinations of things, something has to give It's sort of like you pull on it. If you, if you can get better latency, but you have to give up some bandwidth. So the video quality goes down for a live sport experience, you might just have to do that. I know we all talk about broadcast quality, but again, we're talking about different times now mm -hmm. where you just don't have the bandwidth for a variety of reasons, or maybe the production staff has to be sheltered at home type of environment for that. So it actually proves out this at home or this, uh, even the distributed cloud computing model even better for that. So one of the things you can do about it, if you are planning on using, um, if you're unable to use dedicated circuits and you have to use the internet, there are several protocols that are out there to do help with that. One of the most common ones that's available out there now is called SRT, Secure Reliable Transport, which not only um, can help improve um, uh, the, uh, the user experience of the video by, it adds a small amount of buffering, but it really is small compared to the round trip time of what you can do. But in return for that, it's watchable video because if you completely uh, break it up, you don't want that either. Now, as all of us have, uh, uh, have said on here earlier here, you might not get the best picture quality you would have under normal circumstances, but you'll have definitely quality video enough to enjoy the event. And sometimes, like I said, uh, you have to maybe give a little bit in resolution in order to make up for the latency and the stability of the video for doing that. There's also, of course, the video services forum, uh, new mechanism uh, for open uh, open standards in this area, open specifications, which is RIST, Reliable Internet uh, Streaming Transport. And so these these types of uh, facilities that are out there really do help improve the facilities when you have 
when you have to use in a more of an open internet type of environment where you don't have um, the guaranteed uh, quality of service or service levels agreements you would have with a dedicated circuit such as uh, fiber or satellite. Right, right, right. So Dan, you've been very patient waiting in the background. So uh, do you want to discuss that a little bit and then also show your slides and then we'll kind of give it more of a round. Sure. We, um, we uh, I mean, I agree basically with everything uh, that's been discussed further. We're also in integrating uh, SRT technology in our, uh, in our encoders and decoders. Uh, and it's proving to be quite a, a good, solid and interoperable uh, technology as well, which is uh, a little bit, um, as we start to play with each other and integrate cloud technologies, we can't necessarily be the sole source vendors uh, for all the technology out there. And, um, uh, you know, being able to interact with very interesting production technologies that are happening in the cloud, um, which, which is also another topic that has been broached yet, but may well uh, be one of the uh, one of the topics that come up as part of our discussion here, you don't only necessarily use the cloud to move uh, video anymore, you maybe use it to produce it. Um, and uh, again, having internet friendly links make that a possibility because dedicated circuits, there are not that many. A few broadcasters have them straight into AWS, but in many circumstances, you have whatever your telco is offering you as a, with quality of service, so-so. So I'll, I will jump in quickly, just give you a couple of minutes about, uh, about our, where, what took us our journey to remote production technologies. You know, Matrox has been at this long time, 40 years, uh, and essentially we've been doing, uh, you know, video processing in all those times. Uh, started with, you know, basics of video IO, but made hardware and software video processing, hardware and software codecs, and let's say a little bit more recently, uh, you know, last 10 years or so, we've been looking at, you know, IP, IP streaming processing. So, and we applied it to a number of places, but all of them involving IO, codecs, and stream processing. So we have video, video walls, so feeding streams into video walls for mission critical applications or monitoring, KVM extensions. These aren't necessarily broadcast, but certainly these all test how we would uh, integrate those, those technologies into Appliances like we have here, kind of on the pro AV side of encoding and decoding appliances, uh, be it enterprise or feeding uh, cloud-based distribution, and our big, our big core of our component of our business is actually OEM broadcast <coughs> OEM hardware. Um, so both codecs, uh, I/O, uh, both twenty one ten and NSDI I/O, as well as a lot of processing. So we've taken a lot of that that legacy technology as well as some of the new innovations we've put. And we've made, a, we thought we could really help the broadcast space by creating a, a set of, uh, of encoders uh, that integrate a lot of the best of the technologies we have, encoders and decoders for remote production. Um, basics of it, we wanted to see what else could we do when we sent SDI from the field back into uh, the studio. We wanted to see what kind of signals we could send back from the studio into the field. So in a small little package, we're able to uh, offer some talkback functionality as well as some GPIOs to send tally signals back out into the field. Again, looking for small places where we could use um, uh, you know, uh, our, our encoding and, and IO and make it um, applicable to remote production. <coughs> now, we started remote production with a simple uh, technology down this path simply because we knew broadcasters were looking for ways to reduce production costs and increase, increase content output. And uh, we thought that would be a great way to help them uh, do that, if we can create some creative solutions there. Uh, but with the advent of COVID, um, you know, decreasing staff travel would go uh, maybe a long way. It may even overshadow some of the other motivations for really adopting remote production. So, uh, you know, that was, that's the quick uh, rundown of my of my uh, my some of the slides I wanted to share with you, and and ultimately we are now been trialing the encoder's been out for a year. Uh, we have a lot of OEM customers that have been using that technology as remote I/O into their systems, um, and uh, in fact, uh, VizRT did something recently with um, something called they called Viz, VizRTV, where they had multiple studios feeding into their system into a live 
um, virtual set. So trying to synchronize, as we talked about synchronization, very important to synchronize audio, video, keep latencies very low because if you, and of course qualities have to be significant, uh, sufficient enough so that the chroma keying can be done uh, well in these virtual studios. So 422 10-bit into uh, virtual sets that is occurring on one location while two other people are interacting from 1,000 kilometers apart in real time. Um, very interesting projects, and these are the types of things we want to be able to work on um, okay, moving excellent. forward. Excellent. So Josh, I want to bring you back in, um, you know, because obviously uh, Matthew, Dan, and uh, Jim just hit on a bunch of issues that your customers probably work, deal with, which is, you know, weighing latency versus quality, um, you know, what is acceptable as far as the minimum threshold given the current environment, but obviously things will, you know, we will get back, bounce back and hopefully three to four months and get it at, at a higher level of production again. But how, how have the conversations you've had with your clients been with respect to their concerns over things like latency um, and just, you know, sync and, and sync chip and that kind of stuff? Sure. Um, going back to a, a point that Matthew was saying about bandwidth, you know, bandwidth was always the first question I would always ask, like how much bandwidth will we have available to us on site, right? Like let's start analyzing that today. I feel like my first question is how much access will we have on site first and foremost, right? So like, you know, me, being kind of the sole provider or, or, you know, end user here um, in this forum, you know, a lot of what, 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 uh, what I'm dealing with is sometimes like there's so many great solutions out there and, and I, you know, but all of, you know, I'm taking so many notes, like, oh my God, I, I could totally use this from, <laughs> from Jim and Dan. I have, I have a whole facility of Matrox stuff and Matthew. Where do I, I start? A lot of questions. <laughs> but one of the big challenges is like, how sophisticated can I bring this solution into this celebrity's home or this, this talent's home? Like, can they run that? Will they let me have a technician? Well, you know, so those are like new challenges, obviously, that I think we're all dealing with. And, you know, Jim was saying that they were, you know, he was um, in, 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 a, in two celebrities, you know, home and, and they were so gracious and that's, that's, the, that's incredible. And then there's the challenge of like, oh, they're not going to let anyone in. Can right. we just use something they're familiar with? Right. So I think that that's, that's something that we're dealing with in this current um, climate, but um, you know, latency, um, from from the the early days of satellite to, to where we are today with IP, it's always a question. You know, it's how much latency is this? And I think a lot of the question is how much can be handled, right? You know, there's there's always a give and take with latency. Um, and with you know, with our customers, they want it to be as real time as possible, right? And if the announcers are on site and they're not at the Vista facility calling off monitor. Then, then it becomes a, a, a very big challenge. And you're dealing with IP technology, integrating it into, into the audio, or, and, and then obviously then sending a return so people can see, see the, the end product or, or, or instant replays and, and calling that as well. So uh, I think that discussing latency is always, a, is always gonna be part of the narrative, but um, there are such great solutions out there to, to minimize that and, um, and, and try to bring it down. So when, when we're doing events, we're, we're bringing the latency down as, as much as, as humanly possible, depending on what type of infrastructure is available to us. If we have you know, huge uncompressed fiber pipes, fantastic. And, and I think we're all excited about that. Um, you know, satellite you know, brings a different component because um, satellite sometimes is great because you're, you're, you're somewhat self-contained you roll in a truck and pop up a dish and, and, and you have all this bandwidth right but you're going to a spacecraft and you're coming back down and there's processing and, and that that creates latency um in in our, this new world of ip there's ways to um kind of hedge your bed a little bit but again it also you're creating a large science project as well so um I, what, what's what's amazing and, and what, what i'm super excited about is that there's so many great solutions out there and, and really great companies that are allowing us to push the, that boundary, right? Like a producer can be in one location, the events in another location, the, the core production staff is in a facility somewhere else and the talent's at home, right? That, that's right. kind of what we're all going for and making that work and making it work for the audience that they have no idea what's, you know, that, you know, how much sophistication and planning and, and, and backup redundancy you know, um, protocols are going into that. 
I think that's what we're all excited about. And that's what makes this, this, what we, what we do every day really, you know, the, from the technology side of it, so fascinating that ultimately we've gotten to a place where we, we kind of can flip a switch, right. And, and it works and, and people, and, and, and to a detriment of us, that's kind of, people are expecting that now. Right. And there's so much work that goes into making that, that happen. You know, we were part of the, um, the together at home um, project. And there was so much that went into that, that concert and that, that project. Um, and for the most part, it was, you know, at the people, people at home watching it, it was really smooth, but there was so much planning and that type of project would typically be, you know, months and months of pre-production and coordination and, and planning. And it was condensed into such a small window. Um, but it just, it just, you know, in, in this, climate today, you know, everyone is willing to roll up their sleeves and kind of work together and, and collaborate in a much more organic, um, you know, process. And I think that's exciting for the future of, of what we all do. Right, right, right. Um, well, I guess uh, when I always look at the uh, history of broadcasting, let's go back, you know, there is always a legacy out of crisis, right? So for example, the Kennedy assassination really kind of began the news era, right? I think news, TV newscasts before that were like five to 15 minutes, right, on the evening. And all of a sudden you got longer newscasts at the end of every night. 9-11 obviously kicked off the ticker, which is still with us, but it was supposed to be maybe a temporary thing. You know, is there a legacy here? You know, do you, is there something that's going to come out of this that is around forever? I mean, is the, to me, probably the, the, the biggest thing is people, all celebrities now will be available to do a quick hit within, let's say, a golf tournament where you used to say, we'll have to roll up a truck. Now you're not going to have to say that anymore. You're going to say, you know what, let's just do Zoom and it'll be fine. Anybody's thoughts? I think you're correct. I, I, I really do believe that is this is, uh, as you mentioned, uh, it um, usually causes a, a significant event to occur somewhere to fundamentally change how we do things. I mean, I mean, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of like hesitating to shake someone's hand, right? I mean, that's a, <clears throat> a three to 4,000 year old human event that's been changed uh, at this point in time. So I think the fact that people are accepting the combination of being able to have technology um, out of your home uh, that can provide the um, a decent enough quality where you can set up talent and, and have a, a schedule for things where you can do pop-ins, you know, pop-up channels, pop-in talent um, to be able to produce that using some of these uh, uh, conferencing systems that are coming of age. And, I think this is also going to spur something we haven't put a lot of thought into this yet is what, okay, that's great. So these are pretty simple conferencing things. So now if we do cloud tools back with these conferencing systems, what's going to be the, um, what's going to be the integral of this? In other words, what's the next phase of what these tools will be able to do and really be seamless following, probably I'm going to guess seamless full production, like we were mentioning earlier about doing things as it is a uh, service production, in the cloud distributed cloud computing. Right. And uh, I think it will come to these devices where they'll start doing more and more integration for multiple locations and effects and things like that uh, to make it look, the production look seamless across multiple locations. Sure. Well, Matthew, I know that um, you mentioned the Olympics. And I know that uh, hopefully we'll be next year. I guess that's not a guarantee. Hopefully, that's, hopefully. Uh, that's true. <clears throat> What's your sense on, you know, how will these technologies, because I know that, you know, OBS was pushing the boundaries, right? They're going all IP for the first Always. time, all HDR, all 4K. Always, um, as, as you saw with the with media, media kind ourselves, we're going to be providing for the, uh, the OBS and for the OBS uh, companies that were using the OBS feeds. Um, well, the delay you're always going to be pushed. Yeah. You know, Is that? Will, 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 will life next year be a little bit easier as far as the... Well, I mean, that's what I wanted to explain was uh, what people don't realize, except for those of us in the business, is it's not like you go on to the Olympics and the day before you're, you're playing with the system. The system pretty much gets locked down. You're not allowed to touch it for three or even more months beforehand with the technology. So even though you know there are some things that perhaps we could have done better, for instance, in 4K, and they're actually going to do some 8K, right, in, in this production as well. Some of the rest of the tools that you take for granted with your HD production um, weren't quite there in either 4K or in 8K, so you were mixing production environments for doing that and introducing some issues for that. So there's a little bit of a, a sort of a, a sigh of relief, so to speak, and what they'll do is they'll make those more mature and get them more stable. But at the same time, they are going to squeeze in as much as they can, and I do believe that 
um, you're going to see an increase in the amount of the production that you that they were planning to do for the Olympics next year based on the ability to do these remote video conferencing type of um, in its basic form on them. They're going to incorporate them in. So yes, two things. It's going to allow them to to um, more solidify the advances that they were always trying to push before, but I think they're also going to push in doing these these pop-up um, celebrity type of things, if for lack of a better name for it now. Somebody will come up with a clever name and they'll have it. Well, I mean, the, you know, one of the classic things, questions with the Olympics is, you know, their goal as an event is to become smaller and have a smaller footprint so that more cities and, and could, could bid for the Olympics, because obviously if it keeps growing and growing, then less cities can host it. So it's always been a challenge to kind of tell broadcasters to keep people home. They brought more production people, but it, and at the end of the day, they usually brought a lot more people. I think next Olympics. Well, what, the, what, what they're also doing though is it allows them. Uh, you're right, and having a major hub city, but as you've noticed in some Olympics lately, they have the hub city where they have the major events at, but they start going, you know, hundreds of miles, even more kilometers away uh, yes. from the, with these remote venues, and being able to do, you know, to build upon uh, at home production to do many more, many more types of remote things and over and combined all the technologies that we've talked about today. We've talked about, you know, um, traditional satellite and maybe the, and of course the Olympics always bring in dedicated high bandwidth fiber links, but now they're going to tag those in with um, the cellular networks, maybe bonded cellular. Um, and on top of that, they might be doing some, you know, the 5G is getting more and more released. Maybe there'll be some introduction of some 5G um, technologies that are going to be able on this, particularly the slicing technology that allows them yes. to dedicate particular bandwidth from 5G right. and don't let, you get a crowded stadium, people talking on the phone, you don't want that to take away from your production. So you have to have that slicing technology that 5G has, which up to now wasn't considered the primary first start for 5G, but maybe it will be now when they start right. seeing these um, different things they can do. And of course, even any type of in, uh, internet connection at all, as we talked about earlier, even something that might not be that stable through the use of things like SRT or wrist. And just to get a decent quality, uh, watchable video through and combine that with the higher production, I think you're going to see a lot more of that. Sure. Sure. Well, Jim, why don't you chime in on the 5G since I know you guys are probably looking at that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, so yes, um, uh, there was, there was some successful, uh, uh, test, uh, um, uh, Avi West did at IBC last year uh, with a company, uh, a research uh, and development uh, 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 entity called the B.com, and they were demoing how you could set up with the slicing technique uh, uh, a, a certain level of quality of service. The problem is, though, that the first rollout of 5G will be download. And we'll be able to get video in. For, we'll be able to get program feeds out to the venue, but to get to contribute to get the content out, we're going to be uh, running on LTE or, or 4G for quite a while. Uh, what where I see the big leap in in 5G is getting that latency down. Uh, to further your point, Matthew, that. The, the, the reason why uh, Bonded had to be used at the Seminole Club was uh, they, that was the first time that club's ever been on TV, right? Right, Ken? I mean, you, you mm -hmm. wrote the story, right? Yep. Um, so so if, 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 you, if you're not a, a golfer or you didn't know someone who belonged to that club, um, I, I'm a horrible golfer, but mm -hmm. it was kind of a big deal, though, to see uh, behind the curtain at this club and... I doubt that club had a fiber internet connection. Now, if they had a fiber optic internet connection, we probably could have gone way more aggressive with the latency, getting the latency lower. Cellular actually, when things are operating normal, actually has a pretty decent latency, about, about 50 or 60 milliseconds. The problem is, is it's not constant. You'll see it spike to, to three or four seconds. So you have to have multiple connections. If one connection is misbehaving, uh, yes, we need bandwidth, but I actually put uh, latency first. We want constant or a predictable low latency, um, particularly with the Avi West, because the pictures actually look really good with Avi West, even at low bit rate. So uh, to your point, Matthew, at Seminole, we couldn't, uh, we couldn't have done SMPTE 2110. We uh, can't do that over cellular, even the public internet. The pipes are not 
uh, are typically not big enough or reliable enough or, or can, the latency is not consistent enough. Um, so people say like, oh, are, are you worried or is Avi West worried about 5G eliminating the need for bonding? 5G is going to go, it's meant for short distances. Uh, 5G will not go through building walls very nicely. Um, but if you're outdoors on a, on a, on a golfing, uh, 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 at a golf event, yes, that will help. If you're outdoors at a, at a baseball game, that will help. But that's not the whole picture. Like, like our live PD show, 5G is not going to, unless the cop cars are stopped. But while they're going down the highway, they won't even lock to a 5G right, exactly. uh, 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 connection. So I, I, and I always use the freeway analogy. Um, here, in, uh, here in Southern California, traffic is horrible. I thought New York was bad. It's horrible. It's great here now. They're always adding more lanes. And the second the new lanes open up, they fill it with cars and the traffic still sucks. Right, right. So we're going to open up this 5G. It's going to, that bandwidth is going to get used up right away. Uh, they'll find new uses for it. But as a broadcaster, if we can buy a slice of it, that will certainly help to your point, Matthew. Sure. So Dan, I want to kind of bring you in here to, to take us home, if you will. Um, you know, you mentioned production in the cloud. Um, which it seems like, unfortunately, you know, if we were at NEB, which would be wonderful because obviously this whole crisis wouldn't be going on, um, we would have been seeing a lot of people talking about moving their infrastructures into the cloud and, and Grass Valley, Sony, Everts. It would have been the thing and the theme of the show. Um, can you talk a little about what you see as sort of this, this future of production in the cloud and then how that dovetails with what's going on right now with this crisis and then how this changes the way people are working from home and whether what's the legacy here between production and cloud, what's going on right now, and the need for less people on site? We uh, we've been streaming to the cloud for its kind of contribution or web contribution for for years, and the protocols in place at that time, primarily RTMP, were suitable. There was no real concern for latency, uh, but there's a confluence of, of factors uh, available for bandwidth for for a lot of venues. There is suitable bandwidth to send more than just one stream um, and then when there's not uh, on the then you can go ahead and get some bond cellular technology that's available and use that uh, additional bandwidth to be able to send more than just one stream up so we again a couple ago we started to see people doing you know curation and a variety of other things other than just straight transcoding uh, you know of, of media assets and for live productions and then finally um, I guess maybe Sony announced something last year, uh, last NAB called virtual production. There's a couple of other guys that they were making basically uh, Windows based or workstation based uh, software and said, well, why, why can't we run this on Amazon instant? And um, we really, it, it really just kind of was going up probably in and around any, and then COVID hit. So a lot of people are trying to showcase how they would be using their technology that way. So of course you need the edge devices, uh, the endpoints to get content up, and in many cases, content down. It's not always, at first we thought cloud production was mostly gonna be for OTT delivery. So you produce, you know, remote at home, bring stuff back into your studio to do your regular online or linear delivery, but it may be your secondary channels over OTT where you would produce in the cloud and deliver to the cloud. What we're now just starting to hear is people want to pull those streams back down from the cloud, do additional contribution uh, to it back in the studio. So really, it's come a long way. And, uh, you know, kudos to all the technologists that are contributing to these, uh, to these amazing uh, developments. Not all of them are even video specialists, just network and cloud compute specialists. And we, as the video guys, are trying to take advantage of of that um, that contribution, and I think I think there's gonna be a lot of um, a lot of new uh, you know productions actually out there now. As this as we all start to tweak our our technologies, some some creative uh, uh, some creative guys like Joshua will start saying, hey, maybe I could find smaller and smaller uh, productions that I could offer because it's so. And I got the creative staff to put together good productions, and now the infrastructure to to do it has become very affordable. So the long tail that niche events may become uh, much more prevalent, um, sure. you know, moving forward. Excellent. Josh, any closing thoughts? Yeah, I, I echo that. I, I think, um, 
yeah, that's having an internet problem. Uh, I think ultimately with uh, all the creativity, it's it just interesting to see how everyone can push these narratives. It's it's been it's been exciting to see um, colleagues and 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 friends and competitors and, and vendors and partners all come together and and really um, be able to deliver some interesting ideas. So I think. Um, I think that that's it's amazing, I, and I and I do think Ken, to your point, the thing that will come out of this is more access to people. I think that people will be more willing to uh, give their time and um, and do a, a live hit. Um, I think you're, we're going to see even this summer with uh, some stuff that we're working on. Halftime interviews will be on you know utilizing virtual conferencing and stuff like that. Um, even and I'm going to reference uh, virtual school again. Uh, last Friday, my, my son's assembly had uh, Romero Brito, the artist, come in live from his studio and, and present to the kids, which was fantastic. And uh, you know, got a live view into their into their home. So it's pretty cool. So I think uh, there will be another you know step where uh, some prosumer technology will complement everything that we do at a broadcast party. Gotcha, gotcha. Matthew, what's your closing thoughts on, on this whole move and based on our conversation here and what you're just seeing in the market? Um, <clears throat> well, I think it continues on the line what we've just been talking about. I think we're going to see more and more uh, usages of at-home production, and the at-home production is going to continue as we move from more uh, along the path of software-defined media processing in the steps of uh, what networking had done you know, five to ten years ago and really start to leverage off of cloud-native applications. You're going to see uh, the growth of this and we're at home is a virtual home, right? And then you'll have all these different locations. So it really will be distributed cloud computing on this and also really offering things um, um, as a service that, uh, model as well. I mean, cause we moving things a little bit differently, particularly in our new environment from maybe less CapEx to more OpEx type of thing. And then in the OpEx area, not committing to something per, uh, permanently, but maybe either augmenting or trying out new type of features and functionality. I mentioned before, like 360 degree video and how people really like the concept of tr trying something new, but they don't want to invest in it that much. And that's where we had with our Cygnus 360 degree um, solutions had seen some take up last year. Obviously, we're going to do more things this spring with it too, with COVID-19 put a kibosh on that. Right. We had um, a lot of 360 degree production um, in Europe. Basketball, for instance, had taken off and there was a lot of consumer interest in it, but the, the um, content providers are a little leery about spending a lot of capital expense in that. And that's where these new operating models that are enabled through uh, cloud computing uh, can bring on that. Uh, and the last comment I want to make on this is it's, it's, this is a really decent topic. And as such, um, you know, MediaKind is going to uh, be publishing in the next day or two. So keep an eye on our website for this, a, 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 uh, an application or white paper on at-home production standing a lot of these challenges for that. So come by and take a look, please. Great, excellent. Jim, what's your closing thoughts? With innovation. Yeah, it's, to, to, to further your thoughts, Matt, and, and, and everyone's thoughts is, uh, if there's anyone listening that, that, is, that doubts, uh, you know, is at home production for me, uh, uh, you know, I'm not looking forward to getting on an airplane anytime soon and breathing that recirculated <laughs> air um, I think that that that's a great place. I mean, we've all gone on long business trips and you always come back with that pesky cold that you can't shake. Uh, but, you know, back to what you said, Matt, you know, op, OPEX versus CAPEX. Uh, one of the biggest expenses is uh, uh, to a traditional uh, remote production is all the trucks, all the personnel, all your skilled workers, your skilled personnel, your EVS operators, your TD, your director, you got to fly them all onto site. You got to put them in hotels. You have to feed them versus all these skilled operators now stay at home. No hotels, no airfare. You're not obligated to feed them. They eat at home. They sleep at home. <laughs> And they still want a per diem. The, they're still gonna want a per diem. They're gonna they're gonna want that craft table. <laughs> so 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 um, uh, yeah. So so you know an operator you know if they it, like so let's take the golfing match the the sun the, this Sunday's game those operators gotta break down fly home um, um, they couldn't do another event in the same day so where an operator uh, can do maybe one or two events a week 
if you're doing from at home, you, these, these operators could do two events a day. Right. Um, um, their master control doesn't sit dark half the time. So, so an, an event could happen at, at mid, midday uh, on the East Coast, uh, goes for a few hours, then a late afternoon event in, on the West Coast. The same uh, infrastructure, the same personnel can do these two events. And some of the, some of the folks at NEP and Game Creek and some of the other uh, truck production folks have, you know, on our website, we have a picture of a truck with a line through it. And uh, it's just for marketing purposes or to get people's attention. So uh, I tell some of my friends, like, I, I'm trying to make a point that trucks are not going to go away, but maybe there'll be more of them and they'll be smaller. Um, until we get the latency really, really low over cellular, uh, it's not possible to really shade a camera on a half a second or a second latency. So you'll need some operators on site. So I, I think the, um, the, the, the cost model, the, 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 the cost savings uh, makes a lot of sense. Um, I don't know if we're going to do Monday night football or the Super Bowl, a full at-home production, but we'll have more, uh, more events. Maybe we'll do more AAA, more high school, more college, um, um, people's homes, like you say, Josh, uh, people's homes like we've seen here in Hollywood. So uh, uh, I leave you with that. At, at home is doable and it could save you uh, uh, lots of money. Gotcha. And Dan, final thoughts to you, since you were so patient in the beginning. Close us out. There you oh, go. Well, I think everything's <laughs> been said. I'll just say that I think COVID may, there's a silver lining to COVID, at least from a personal perspective. All my kids, uh, all the sporting events have been canceled in my area, except for golf. And maybe I'll be able to get out to play golf with me. That was nothing else <laughs> they do. So that's the one silver lining to this COVID lockdown. Maybe I'll make golfers out of my children, because right now they don't want to have anything to do with it. There you go. But, um, <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate your time this afternoon. Stay safe. Hey, thank you, thank Ken. Thank you so much, Ken. Thanks, Ken. Thanks, yeah, everyone. Be safe, guys. Bye.